we've kind of exposed you to the design process through the little wallet activity that we you did it. We're starting week five. Whew. Purdue didn't lose this weekend. Yay! In football. Anyway, um, this should be for the new. What we're going to do is like, talk about. We're going to go through specification development, conceptual detail design, talk about the, the rest of the design process, talk about some strategies in here. Um, there's a lot to cover. The design document that we asked you to look at has information on this in detail. Your design documents in your lab have templates for these different places. The design reviewers, when they come in in two weeks, ooh, yeah, in two weeks, when we have design reviews, we show them our design process. So making sure that you understand where you are in your own projects is important. Next week, we're going to have a discussion about ethics, social context, and we want you to take a survey, which we will um, I'll mail out the, the link um, to that. All right. Um, we were talking about, <coughs> last time, we were talking about user-centered design getting information from people. If you looked at the wallet activity that you did, you actually had a user that you can interview. So getting information from people through observations, interviews, are, are wonderful and they're important. Sometimes we, we don't have users handy when we need to make a decision. So we're going to talk about what we can do with what we call personas or profiles of people and scenarios, a little bit about role playing and then prototyping. You want to prototype early, often, um, and cheaply. We talked about the um, other information. So the idea on a persona is what if I didn't have, if I'm designing something for my partner here with a wallet, but I only see him in lecture and I need information about him. I could describe um, him. Or for a lot of you with your users, can I start to craft um, a, a person, a description of the person. So what I can do is to say, as we're making design decisions, what would this person think about the decisions we have to make? Or can I start to get, try to get their perspective? When we did the wallet, one of the reasons we did that is, is to try to get you to understand we have our view, but to really be effective in design, I need to start to see the view of others. So persona is one of the tools that we would do. It would be really good to have a persona for each of the key stakeholders that you need to have. Um, this is an example of, of one of the projects and some of the personas that, that they described. Um, what they did is they looked at primary um, Holders, this is a, a device for, <coughs> for GLASS, which is the Greater Lafayette Area Special Services. They work with um, children in the Lafayette, West Lafayette area uh, that are in school that have um, special needs. They identify the primary user. It's a student and their instructor, which could be a teacher, could be a, a other person. And then secondary users, who's going to maintain the thing, and then the parents of the children. If I look at the instructor, can I come up with a profile of what the instructor, and so this was, is information that they got from the instructor, 
and then information that they have from the students. So user profiles as far as can we describe the type of people who are going to use this. If I dial in then and say I'm going to create a persona. Now notice here the persona has a name. You could even give the persona a picture. And then the more detailed. So this is a description of one of the personas that they had of a example. So this person is going to represent one of the stakeholders. So as I'm going through and I'm making design decisions to say, okay, what would Mrs. Brown think about this? Or, or what are some of the issues that Mrs. Brown would have? Does that make sense? It creates real. It's not as good as having my real user here but in lab, we can make decisions on this, or it's just a tool to try to get that person's perspective. This is an example of a student, again, named, and as much detail as we have. Does this persona represent all users? Oh, this kills me. Okay, I was just going to comment. I said, yeah, it is a little interactive, but because you heard no and I paused, people are like, oh, that wasn't the right answer. Let's try yes. Let's try something else. Just to get them to move on to the next slide. This doesn't represent all the users, right? If I look at, if I go back to the profiles, students could be aged 6 to 20, but it, it's an example of one. So I've got the user profiles that remind me about the spectrum. I've got the personas as specific people. This is a tool that's used by an industry in that by professional designers as far as, okay, I want to make sure that, that, Ale that this is going to work for Alex. Because I don't have a, um, a access um, to them. And then I could come up with scenarios where my design has to work. So this is an example where Mrs. Brown and Alex are interacting. You've got a situation or task. The goal, the student's goal is to learn, <coughs> to request. <coughs> Teacher's goal is to help the student understand basic communication. So this project is for a, a student learning to communicate and understanding what the, the different stakeholders are going to do in, in this scenario. So our, what we can do is to say, okay, in this scenario, how is our design going to work? Is it going to benefit um, them? So we've got user profiles to describe our users. We've got personas that describe them. And we've got scenarios where our design has to work with the people. Okay. And then I can role play too, that I can, you know, in lab, we've got a profile and said, okay, you're going to be one of the students, you're going to be one of the teachers. Neither of you look excited about this. We have seats up front. Or you can stand in back, it's fine. Um, um, with that. So these are tools if you can't... Um, Yes, this has the caution sign. The best thing is interacting with your real users. But you can't say, well, we're not going to actually talk to them for another month, so we can't really do any real work. And then we respond, it's like, well, we can't really give you a good grade, sorry. And everybody's grumpy. Is what do I need? I need to make a decision. You're, you've got a team meeting and you're meeting on Tuesday evening, and you've got to make a choice on a decision, and your advisor's not there, and what do you do? These are some of the tools to help you make decisions, and you can come back and explain why. Okay? Make sense? Prototypes. Prototypes are great. Your, the wallet activity. You all created a prototype, and they were beautiful. They were wonderful. Some people were sad. They're like, aren't you going to collect these and display them? No, sorry. Prototypes are to be used to gather information and to continue over in the design. 
it is much more effective to show somebody something or to let them touch it or interact with it. You get much better information. Um, I, I always love this one on the, on the left hand side. This is a highly sophisticated piece of medical equipment used to do nasal surgery stuff. <coughs> and your nose is very sensitive. So it has to be very precise. IDO, um, it's an international design firm. Some people at Stanford started it. How many of you have you ever used a computer mouse? They invented it. Long time ago, I know. But people will come, and they're very expensive. And I heard when I was up in Chicago, the person that was the design lead on this said they'd been working for a few months. They called, told the company they had a prototype they wanted them to see. The company was so excited they'd come up with a prototype. They thought a prototype was a work, fully working model. They were out on the East Coast. The CEO sent his top people, vice presidents, all the way to California. And they showed them that. <laughs> but what it was, was everything in the industry was, um, can I borrow your pen for a minute? Was linear. The handle was in line with the tool. And they got in and they started looking and they said, it sure makes sense for it to be at a 90 degree. Thank you. But nothing in the industry was like that. And I had a boss that would traumatize young engineers if he came up with something innovative, he would set a trap and go, oh, that's new, that's innovative, isn't it? Right, and we teach you innovation's good, right? Yeah. Right, it is. And he'd say, I've never seen anything like that. Only one of two things is possible. You're either a genius, brilliant, smarter than anyone else in the entire industry. Or you're a complete moron that missed something that everybody else has seen. Prove you're a genius, not a moron. Right now. Like in front, this is a design review. Traumatic. Like, ah! I only saw it. Never happened to me, thank goodness. <laughs> but what they said was they wanted to get people there and hold it and said, this is the innovation that we see. Now they had people working on the technology. And let me be clear. There are some times when we prototype we need to see if the technology works. On one of my international trips, I was flying back from Europe with this guy, and I got talking to him, and he's working on a startup. I said, oh, you know, is this your first startup? No, I've worked on about eight. Now I thought, well, you must not be very good. <laughs> or you have bad luck with startups. No, he was actually really, really good, but his part was could we get the technology to work? He was one of those, I'm gonna say, kind of stereotypical engineers on the technical, very technical. And he just wanted to work on the technology. Users or people are an annoyance. <laughs> but they were doing something, it was like amazing. They were, they were using non-invasive testing. They're actually using light shining light through and getting information on your blood. And I can't remember what kind of diseases that they, it was like, whoa, you can do that? We think so. And they were outside the United States because in the United States, we don't let you do things to people. So they were off in another country. We talk about ethics next week. Don't get into it right now. <laughs> All right? But what occurred to me was he was talking about the prototype. What IDO showed them is this is a functional prototype. We're, we're going to put the electronics in this package, but we think this is going to be much more effective for the users. The guy I was talking to on the plane, he described the stuff. He says, yeah, we figure out how to make it work, and then some of the other designers come and make it pretty. I'm like, how about usable? Because he described it. This patient's here getting monitored and there's like they're just draping wires all over him i'm like that doesn't sound safe but they got the technology to work so sometimes you're working on fit function usability things 
sometimes you're seeing if the technology can work. Sometimes you're doing those in parallel. Okay? Our users often don't care what kind of microprocessor you're using or what kind of materials behind something. They're interested in how it interacts. So getting information from users can be effective. Um, this is a hand-drawn first prototype <coughs> of a piece of software for uh, an, an app. So if I'm looking and doing like software, a, a person, you know, a, a, a drawing on a piece of paper can be very effective because I'm trying to get information. Just like when you draw, drew your things over in a wallet. These are prototypes. I'm just trying to get information. That sheet that you had for the wallet, when I show, when I go and get information from the user, don't say, do you like it? Push them and, and look to say what worked, what could be improved, do I have other ideas, what questions we have, that little grid to get information. You're never trying to impress users with your design, you're trying to get information from them. This is one of the, the shifts you have to make from student who's trying to impress adults so they give you better grades into designers to say, I want to get the best information so my product is going to be better than anybody else's. Does that make sense? All right. Um, specifications. <coughs> Number one, two important things. You have to be able to measure a specification. Specifications are the requirements that are what our design has to do. Think about it as what it needs to do, not how. Everybody, when they start a design, start thinking how, here are my ideas. But you have to say, what does it have to do? You have to be able to measure them, and you have to be able to test them. They also need to be objective in some way. Now, when I lived in Cincinnati, they do a lot of Procter & Gamble, big company there. They do a lot of consumer products. And there's a lot of things as far as consumer products. It's like, oh, does a customer think that this product is easy to use? Or does it smell nice? How do I quantify that? What? Yeah, I could do, is it a survey? I could get a focus group. Hey, here's some of the different sense. What do you, oh, I really like this one. Ooh, that one's terrible. Now, is that perfect? No. But what, what they do sometimes is I get representative people from my different markets and say, what do you like? And it's like, okay, if they seem to like this one, it gives me better confidence. So sometimes I can look at it and I might say, all right, my quantifiable is, let's say, 8 out of 10 people are going to think that it's pleasing to smell, for example, or something like that. So I can, I can define something, and I might have to get data um, on that. What are some example requirements for some of your projects? I want a couple examples. I should have done that. Uh, I asked you before. Yes. Um, I'm building, or my team, we're building a uh, rain cover for electric, an, an electric wheelchair. Okay. Um, a rain cover for an electric wheelchair. Yes. Okay. One of our specifications is it has to be able to actually protect from rain. And oh, yeah, to keep them dry. Right. Okay. <laughs> can I measure that? So one of the requirements is it has to keep the wheelchair user dry. Can I measure that? Can I test it? Good. OK. Another one. Different. Yes? We're building, well, redesigning activity day board for differently abled adults to improve their cognitive function. OK. So, so an activity board for adults <laughs> with um, mental, disabilities. mental disabilities. What's a requirement? So one of the requirements is there has to be an improvement in their cognitive function. function. Yeah. Can I measure that? Yeah. Can I measure that? Yeah. yeah. 
given the right expertise, you can measure that, right? Can I test that? Now, some of this, and, and I go back like this, that's the end goal, is there may be things that I need to do. So a requirement like that, I might say, can I back up and say, if I do A, B, and C, then it's going to improve their, so I might have things I can test in the lab. Does that make sense? To test. And actually, it's the same thing like over in the rain. The ultimate test is, oh, let's wheel somebody around with the winds blowing, but can I do things in the lab? Okay? If I look at um, different types of <coughs> specifications, there's physical, there's functional, environmental, be thinking about what's going to happen to your project when people are done with it. There are all kinds of horror stories in electronics. You know, what happens to the computers when we're done? Oh, they're recycled. Often they're shipped to play, you know, they create all kinds of hazards. A lot of companies right now, the designers, thinking from a sustainability standpoint, are thinking, okay, when the product is done, we're, we're, we may be responsible or liable. Large equipment, like tractors, trucks, stuff like that, already are, as far as can we reclaim, can we recycle um, the things. There's human factors, ergonomic, economic. This is an example of a project with um, some specifications <coughs> devices to help develop um, communication skills. And this is where it comes. So a lot like yours. So here's the overall goal. But then when I get what what is the requirement need to do, I'm going to I'm going to come down with a set of more specific requirements. Or, or more specific that I can get. So in order to achieve the bigger goal, we're going to record and store sounds. So if you look at the progression, I got to play sounds for different cards, that we're going to have different cards. This function is going to come down to say, OK, I have to record and store sounds. Being more specific, I got to think about what the length of the message is, the memory requirements, the number of messages. So this is just coming out of this being more specific. The length of message, is that measurable? Is it specific yet? Like how long? Now I have to pick something. With your users, you want to come up, what we said here is a message lasts five seconds, each message can take this much memory, and number of messages I need to store 15. So now I've gone from, oh, we need to play sounds for cards, to I've got my requirements over here. I've got to be able to store messages that last for five seconds. Here's the memory. I, I need 15 messages. It needs to be able to identify 16 different cards <coughs> to accommodate different cards, and the, the sound must be tied over the car. These are the things that it needs to do to work. What we believe is if we do this, then it can be used to help the children learn to communicate. Does that make sense? It, it's as specific. When I'm doing these, it's a really good thing to look at what have other people done? What other products are there for, for a, a number of reasons? One, what your partner wants might be available. I think it was last year, a team came and said, they got to this stage in the design process. They found something that met their specs for 40 bucks, $80, something. It was less than 100 And they freaked out. 
Like, ah, it already is there. We said, no, this is good. Buy it. They bought it for their partner, <coughs> delivered it, partner was happy. The team got the rest of the semester off. <laughs> no, that part's not true. <laughs> what do you think the team did then? We looked at the next project. They went back in prob project identification. And by the way, then they came back and said, does that count as a delivery? Because when you deliver a project, we have shirts that say we made a difference on the back. They're kind of cool. And so, yeah, I was like, I guess they did. So that was actually the shortest development cycle I think we've ever had. It was like four weeks. But, yeah, it was a delivery. Yay, we celebrate it. Okay? So that may be, yeah, easy way to get shirts. The second thing that you want to look for existing things. Remember what I said? I had that boss said, wow, what you're doing is different than anybody else. What have other people done? Have other people done similar things? That starts to give you more confidence if other people have done something kind of similar. Then that means, OK, maybe we're headed in the right direction. There may be existing things. Often the type of projects we work on, they're existing products, but they're too expensive. So what we're doing is we're trying to make them cheaper. There may be ideas out there of what you can in incorporate. Do not infringe on anyone else's patents. And this is an important thing in the design, is what we're working on, does somebody else already have a patent in this area? And we could get arrested or sued. That would be bad, right? Being arrested or sued would be bad, right? Yes. I didn't think that was a hard question. <laughs> Took people a minute. Um, with that, all right. When you're doing your specs, there are different ways to keep them. This is a <laughs> form we recommend. You list a specification requirement. Over here, you say, how will you know you've achieved it? Okay. How, how are we going to actually test it? And then you can check on completed. There's a column there, the second column, origin. Why would that be there? Wait, what? The thought process? There, what? Um, it will, it's a justification for why this requirement is necessary. Okay, it's a justification for why that requirement's there. There are times it's like, oh, this product costs four times as much because it had to be blue. You're like, why did it have to be blue? We don't know. But it was on our specification list. Turns out one of the advisors we had, that was his favorite color, and we made it, tried to make it blue. And now we just quadrupled the cost. Sometimes you'll come back, you can't meet all the requirements fully. How's your homework going? <laughs> Yes, but, but yeah, hard enough you had to help him. Um, <laughs> now I lost my train of thought. Sometimes if I go back, a design reviewer, when you have design reviews in two weeks, you're going to have industry people again. I'm like, oh, they must know what they're talking about because they came with a shirt with a logo on it. And, and somebody actually hired them for a full-time job, and they said the thing had to be blue. So we totally scrapped our red idea, and it needed to be blue. Why? Because Ben at the design review said he thought it should be blue. OK? When you're having to make decisions, can I go back and understand how important it is? Or if I've got two specifications and I can't meet both, let's go back and understand the origin. Is one more important? OK? So that's an important piece. If I look at example ones here, here are example specifications, where the origin is, how will I achieve it. Um, down here, you know, the project should be educational. I can do some type of pre-post test. There are different ways 